this is the IT Business Podcast, a very special presentation. Welcome to our panel discussion on diversity and inclusion. And today we are honored to be joined by two accomplished CEOs in the channel. And they're going to share some insights and experiences with us on how to create a more diverse and inclusive workplace. So for those of you that have been following us for a while, we've done a few of these episodes. I feel that they are very important to continue these conversations and try to have effective and meaningful change. And we hope that today we will inspire you to take action and make a positive impact on your company, on your clients, on your world. And without further ado, let's get started. Joining me, Emmy Glass from Synchro, and Michelle Accardi from Lion Guard. Ladies, how are you? Great. Good. How are you, Marvin? I am doing good. Uh, thank you for taking the time out. I know that as CEOs, you're very busy, so the time is much appreciated. So why don't we go ahead and start real quick with giving the viewers and listeners an idea of who you guys are. So Emily, with Synchro, please can you give us a little bit of your background and... Uh, what you're doing there at Synchro. Sounds good. I'll start with Synchro. So Synchro, um, for those of you who haven't heard, uh, is an all-in-one RMM and PSA platform with growout access as well. So we basically um, try to provide everything that a growing MSP needs to run their business. Uh, and you know we really listen to our partners. So we're all about growing with our partners and really um, you know hearing what they need and making sure we're delivering on that and growing with them. So that's our our kind of core offering. And then um, just a little bit about myself. I joined Synchro almost two years ago, a little less than that, but almost two years ago, I've been CEO. And prior to that, I was at a company that some people might know called Datto uh, in the industry. And I uh, ran a lot of different departments there and had a wonderful learning opportunity. Um, what was really my introduction to the MSP space and to MSPs and their business challenges and needs. And I got to hear a lot about that when I, um, when I worked with the tech support group, many, 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 all the issues, but also all the growth stories and all of the opportunities as well, which really made me sort of fall in love with the MSP space. And so I'm really happy to be back at Synchro. And prior to that, I have a um, degree in engineering, computer engineering. So I've been sort of in tech even before I started my career in the MSP space and been working at a, a variety of different tech companies during my time. So it's a little bit about my background. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Well, like Emily, uh, I absolutely love the MSP community and um, my journey is a little different than Emily. So uh, I've only been at LionGuard as CEO for the last two months. Uh, so she was two years, I'm two months, uh, but I have vast experience in the MSP space. So I was 17 years uh, at CA Technologies and different uh, parts of the partner ecosystem, uh, sales, marketing, and, and engineering, went on to Start to Start Communications, which was a unified communications company that uh, sold through MSPs into the space uh, and then uh, exited that business for about $500 million uh, to, uh, to, uh, in a two-part uh, exit to Sangoma and Comcast. Uh, and then went on to become an MSP uh, and uh, was CEO of a, one of the largest MSPs, over a hundred million dollar MSP, uh, logically, where I got such an ed education, having been on the tech vendor side for nearly 25 years of my career to going to be an MSP and feel the real difference um, was so eye-opening. And it also just put me in a place where I said, you know, my super, my super talent is in driving growth and helping MSPs better their business and help pro with their profitability. And when I found the opportunity at LionGuard, it just seemed like kismet, frankly. So for those of you who don't know what LionGuard is, uh, we are configuration change detection and response. So you think about all the problems um, and challenges you have by this landscape of changes that happen in the cloud with users, assets, endpoints, uh, all the way through, um, you know, as any operational changes happen in your business and being able to get visibility to what those changes are and the risks that, that might come of it 
um, is really, I think, mind blowing in terms of being able to have that kind of capability that help you get to help you get in front of challenges for IT governance and doing cybersecurity risk mitigation. All right. So uh, the format today will be the three of us just having a little chat, a little discussion. Uh, we've got some bullet points and some questions we may or may not get to depending on how the flow goes. But I do want to say to everyone that is watching live, there is a little chat on the side there. So if you have some comments, some questions, want to go ahead and say thank you for a couple of comments. Uh, Cass Cooper, very excited for this chat. Hi, Emily, Michelle, and Marvin. So uh, those can be thrown in there and we'll get to them as we go. So normally we would start with a little question about, you know, what do you think diversity is? Bob? I want to start with this and I want to ask you guys a question. Uh, so just attended the PAX 8 Beyond inaugural conference. And one of the best things that happens at conferences is all that time in the hallways, after hours that you get to sit and hang with other people. Usually it's to talk about your stack and what are you doing in your business and what do you think of this session? Well, one night I ended up having a discussion with three or four, so four other uh, attendees and we got to talking about diversity. We had just left the Nelly concert and it was just funny to watch the observations, me as a black guy sitting in an audience full of white people, dancing to Nelly and all of that. And I don't know how we got onto it, but we got onto it. And I found it at times awkward because they were asking me to try to explain what I felt during that time as well as other times and trying to explain to them, well, when do you feel offended or when do you feel that diversity is not happening? And it was just a whole discussion. So I kind of wanted to ask you guys, um, how do you guys deal with situations like that when people are trying to ask you, explain what you mean when you're not feeling included or something like that? Do you, do you have thoughts that you can help me with <laughs> the next time I deal with that? Sure. Could you get me a cup of coffee, Marvin? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be, uh, <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of, I, I think, you know, honestly, honestly, um, you know, I'm not offended by when people ask me about what my experience is as a woman, in, as a CEO, or growing up through the business. But I think they don't always understand the ex the little experiences, right? Being the one that's asked to go get the coffee for the meeting right. or being the person who's assumed to be the administrative assistant versus the executive in the room. Um, those are the things. And, and and I think just calling that out and, you know, and when people make those kinds of mistakes, um, you know, giving them some, again, being humble enough as a leader to go, hey, they're human. And uh, maybe they won't make that mistake the next time uh, if if we're human in how we interact with someone uh, from that's that's from my perspective. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I take every opportunity to talk about, you know, awkward, awkward things. We do that at Synchro uh, in daily life. So, yes, it is awkward sometimes. You know, maybe the intent is not that great, depending or you don't know, you can't trust the intent. But I kind of view every 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 exchange as like an opportunity, um, and I think change has to start with curiosity. So to me, I, I try to interpret it as with good intent and with curiosity, and it's a learning moment potentially that can help um, these people, some, someone in the group, even myself, learn about what different experiences are. And these conversations are going to be awkward. Like I'm not sure how you have some of these conversations without it being awkward or people making mistakes in how they're expressing themselves. I think that's part of the process to have change happen. So I think being a bit forgiving, but also holding people accountable in those conversations, like Michelle said, saying when it makes you feel uncomfortable or people cross a line or you have to correct like, well, actually, you know, that's not how I would say that. Or I, I am taking that in a way maybe you're not intending. I think that dialogue is part of the the transformation we're we're going through because no, we're not perfect yet. <laughs> All right, so I'll have some thoughts on that. And we'll come back to it maybe at the end, and I'll tell you how I ended. Thanks for starting with a softball, Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, Michelle put a post in there saying Marvin likes to ask the hard questions. So <laughs> diving right in. The opportunity. Uh, but let me ask, how about this as a softball question? Uh, I know that Michelle, that you've, you've been in the CEO just for a few months, but you've been in the industry for a while. Emily, we know your history. What types of changes, and let's start with the positive that you have seen in the industry for women and in particular women CEOs? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I started, so I was thinking back, I, would, I had to do math this morning. I was like, so when did I enter the tech industry again? <laughs> oh, no, the number's bigger than I wanted. Um, but, you know, I entered and I, I did computer engineering. So this was 1996 when I started university, just to put a, just to put a date on it, because Marvin, you were, you, were, you were teasing us about how old we are earlier. Um, so I started university in 1996. You, you mean how young you are? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Our age. Um, I was one of 10 women in my uh, like, like orientation program. And then, you know, just 10% women in the program overall. And I think as I look around, you know, certainly at Synchro, um, but also just in my experience in, in the MSP industry and tech companies, I think that percentage has definitely increased. So just the amount of, uh, you know, different types of people entering tech and staying in tech and having careers has definitely increased. And then I've been, maybe I've been lucky uh, and this is not true everywhere, but I have been very fortunate to have examples and role models of women in leadership position, positions, whether that was just, you know, one level ahead of me or, um, you know, running the company or, or at the exec team level to point to, to see that like, oh, this is possible. And I think there's more instances of that. And that's one thing that's definitely, um, you know, changed for the positive. I see it. I see it very much the same way Emily does. The fact that we're on this podcast today together, two women CEOs in the same industry uh, that are able to have these kinds of discussions itself is a is a proof point that things are are getting better. And and I was also lucky. I had role models growing up uh, within CA Technologies that were uh, female leaders in IT. In, in sales, uh, in, in marketing, in all these different areas. So that was very helpful for me to continue those, I'll call it coaching relationships along the way. And when I think about how many w more women there are to have those kinds of coaching relationships with than there were when I started out, I think that really is a, a sign that things are getting much better. So there have been some reports and I, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read the links I sent and, and all of that, but the reports from last year and previous year try to indicate that there are women leaving the tech industry in droves. Now, I don't see that. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't really paying attention because I was paying attention to the, the color line. But when I went to the recent conference, there was a lot more women at that particular conference. And I don't know if it was just because, you know, of a new conference. Um, a lot of the people that work for Pax8 are women. I, I, I don't know the numbers and the statistics and stuff, but I don't see that. And I, you know, the fact that you mentioned that, you know, we have women CEOs here and there were a lot to choose from. So the numbers seem to me like they're increasing. How do you guys see it? I think it. I think first of all, you're you're looking out a lot at the vendor community more so than the MSPs themselves. Uh, I did not see when I was, and sadly, when I was CEO of an MSP, it wasn't like I got tons of resumes of women to begin with. And the women that I did have, you know, let's say pandemic and just post pandemic, childcare super hard issue right now, especially during the pandemic, and and ultimately people having to choose where they spend their time. Do they prioritize their family life um, from the perspective of I can't get care uh, and trying to manage a household can be very difficult. So I think at the, at the mid-level to smaller MSP level, my sense is, is that there are probably women who are leaving uh, more often to make those uh, difficult choices between career and family. Um, you know, uh, especially uh, especially during the the pandemic er era i think that that really ha happened quite a bit uh, i think 
a lot of the vendor community tries to put in place things to, uh, I'll say, secure women into into roles and keep them there and give more levels of flexibility. I'm seeing more of that happen at the vendor level, but I think it's got to be harder at the mid-level, small uh, business level to be able to have those kinds of safety nets for women. And so I do think women are leaving. Yeah. And, and uh, I agree. I, you know, the data, the data talks, I believe the data, right? I, I don't think, you know, you asked us for the positives that have changed in the industry, but I don't think either of us would say we're there, we're there yet or problem solved. And I do think, I agree with Michelle, there's been a lot of pressures throughout the pandemic in the last few years and people sort of making life decisions and balancing stressors and, and factors in their lives and trying to, to cope with all those things. And I think, you know, you, you point to like, well, the conference had more women or maybe this vendor has more women. I think there's pockets where um, there's flexibility and there are environments that might be different than the norm or different than the standard. I think the standard environment is still really, really difficult um, to, I don't know, I don't wanna say survive, maybe excel in. Um, or maybe survive, depending on your life situation. And then you have pockets where, yeah, I agree, Michelle, a, a micro MSP, you know, one, two person shop is, doesn't have, can't afford the flexibility or to create that flexibility, um, just can't afford to do it, where maybe there's pockets of companies that, that can afford to create that environment, can, can afford to challenge the norms um, and do things differently. So, for the two of you coming in as CEO of a company, two questions I'm going to ask about that. One, the research also says that organizations that have women at the top have more diverse organizations top to bottom. When you look at your organizations versus others in our industry, do you think that that's true? Well, for Syngro, I know it's true. <laughs> because we make a very conscious effort uh, to create that environment, number one, um, and to attract that talent, and number two, we measure it. Um, and, and, you know, we have a lot of practices to make sure that we're building a different environment. So our exec team is 70% women. Um, our leadership team, so the VP level, is 70% women. And our exec team is 43% BIPOC. So that, but that didn't, like, magically happen just because I'm a woman, I put emphasis in creating that team and I put, and my leadership team puts emphasis on, on expanding that to the entire employee base every day in like the practices and what we emphasize as important to get done every day. So it's, it's a very conscious effort. And I think you, kudos to you, Emily, for, for but I, I, I think that women-led organizations are more diverse. Uh, and it's not just about having more women. It's about more diversity in general. Um, and for us, I look across the population of Lion Guard, and it's extremely diverse. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a, a female CFO. We have myself. Uh, you know, um, we look at the diversity of our, of our team. Uh, from, uh, again, a nationalities perspective, you know, uh, Joe Alipat, our founder, uh, is Indian, and uh, Vin, our head of marketing, is Asian. I mean, we, we have a very diverse uh, executive team as well, and I'm really proud of that, and I think if you look through our organization, you see that as well. Do you think that that's something that happens because of the way that you saw the industry or you saw the positions as you were rising, you know, when you guys started off in positions and as you moved up, you made a conscious effort to say, I'm going to make sure it's different for those coming behind me. Well, I think I made the conscious effort to go to Lion Guard because I saw that kind of environment already. Yeah. Uh, so I can't say that I've created that environment there, but I was conscious in choosing my next role to be at a company that aligned with my vision around uh, DEI. Okay. Yeah, I think that's very important too, for whatever level you're at. I mean, you have the choice of company you're going to and choosing one that is welcoming, that encourages belonging, that spends time, that has sends signals, right? That they're focused on uh, making everyone feel like they belong and uh, spending energy on that. 
And so it's a little bit chicken and egg, right, Michelle? It's like, you know, do you choose if you choose the, the spot that cares, then you'll have more influence too. So then it kind of builds on each on, on itself. So you know, Synchro was already a very welcoming environment before I got there. Um, I I hope <laughs> I, the actions I've taken have enhanced that, um, and it kind of cascades down, right? You want I've always wanted to create um, and use my influence to create an environment that's different. And that kind of engenders others that want that same flexibility or that same freedom to create something different. It attracts them uh, to come work. So it, it kind of is this like reinforcing cycle. All right. I just want to acknowledge the people in the chat. Thank you for asking questions and comments. We'll try to come back and get to some of those. Uh, but I want to ask you guys, I, I hope this is a softball question. <laughs> um, you can ask us hard questions too. I, I know, I, but I like to sprinkle, you know. Were there any role models that you guys had before you became CEO that kind of, you know, helped you, guided you along the way? And then after you became CEO, did you find more peers that were willing to to help you? Yeah. Well, go you go, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so I have one. Uh, I have a group of of women who have been uh, very helpful. To me, as I I grew up, one per particular, her name is Joanne Moretti. Uh, she is um, she's currently CRO at a company called Fictive, but but she was a general manager at CA when I was a young executive growing up, and she really poured herself into me. And as I grew in roles, you know, I watched her uh, go toe to toe with men who uh, underestimated her or uh, didn't take her seriously and I saw her succeed over and over again. And so that gave me confidence as uh, as I sort of grew into my new roles and I would use her as a confidant. I continue to use her as a confidant today, um, but I've created this additional circle of women leaders, um, CEOs like Catherine Rose, who's in the, uh, the chat uh, with us right now uh, with Channel Wise, um, you know, had, had been a, a real inspiration to me in terms of being a founder woman and the mentality you need to have when you're going into a startup. Um, so I, it has grown as I've got, and I'm, I now look to Emily and say, look, I hope I, I can now leverage Emily is great. Uh, knowledge uh, from her experience at Synchro and, and previously as well. So I, I think it does grow as, as you get more influence and you gather more spheres of influence as you grow into a larger and larger roles. Absolutely. And, but men, men are important too. I want to say that uh, there's a ton of men who I could not have gotten to the place that I am without their um, guidance and help. Uh, I'll start with my husband, who was a stay-at-home dad for four years uh, to help me uh, so I didn't have to worry about those things. So, uh, And I saw a lot of um, bias that he experienced taking that decision to be a stay-at-home dad. Um, uh, so I'll start with him, but other executives, Norm Worthington, who was the CEO and founder of Star to Star, believed believed in me and pushed me into my first uh, CRO role. Um, so folks like that who have really poured into me over the years. Yeah, very well said, Michelle. And I think um, for me, the role model question is always difficult because um, I think, you know, we talked before about it. It's, it's kind of important to see yourself uh, or someone who looks like you or that you can identify with, whatever that, you know, flavor that looks like. Uh, in a role that you might aspire to. I think that's important. And that's maybe where the role model piece comes in. But for me, the more important part, at least in my career, has been um, twofold. One has been exec coaches or any kind of coach, whatever, whatever level you're at. I have been very, very fortunate. I had a, a very early boss who believed that everybody should just have a coach. It's like playing basketball or a sport. Like everybody's got a coach so you can get better. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. Right, you're not doing bad just because you have you need a coach. So um, I, I've I, you know had that philosophy ingrained in me. So I've been fortunate to um, have early sort of exposure to having a coach, and that's just been become sort of the norm and really influential in helping me reflect on you know how am I being perceived, what's my style, how can I improve, and getting that feedback. Um, and then the second thing has been like Michelle said, having having a mentor or someone who 
uh, sponsors you in the organization. And so I was really, really fortunate at Datto, Austin McCord was that like gave me a ton of opportunities. These are the people who like see your potential and also have the ability to give you an opportunity. And Michelle, yes, you have to say, you have to say yes to it and you have to like accept it um, and be willing to, to tackle it. But um, it's really like access to opportunities, I think across the board for not just women, but all kind of marginalized groups is really one of the core problems. So if you have someone, man, woman, whatever position they're in that can give you an access to an opportunity, that's really, you know, what, how, like what's going to, you know, um, help you grow and uh, move you forward. All right. So let's take a little bit of a break here from me asking you guys questions. I didn't prepare, prepare you for this. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the tables and ask you guys, do you have any questions for me? Oof. Um, I have a question for you. I don't know if it's a softball, though. I, I meant my medium, medium. <laughs> <size draw. Yes. laughs> um, I'm curious in, you know, because you run an MSP and you also go to a lot of conferences. You were talking about being exposed to different groups. Um, when you, when, have, have you, you know, have you worked directly with, um, with women in the past and what's kind of been uh what's been some of the challenges around that or 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 not have you felt like it just flowed naturally and like there, there's no issues well yeah. well i can say that i have hired women as techs for my business and i have worked with women ceos of other msps and vendors so one of my favorite cable vendors was you know two two gals that ran a cable company and they were fantastic unfortunately they moved out of the area but they they were my vendor of choice and it wasn't specifically because they were women it's because they were they were good they did quality work um in terms of how i've viewed it it's listen i've had to deal with diversity my entire life and i never really see it as diversity i just gravitate to who's doing the better job, who makes me feel the most comfortable. And that's what I gravitate to. So I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but that's that's my experience. I think my question sort of piggybacks on that. How, you know, I, I'll oftentimes feel like there's still a, a challenge for women in the networking part of the business with MSPs, because uh, there is still so much that's based around, let me take you out for a round of golf or drinks or, and does it, is there any awkwardness from your perspective um, on the male to female networking aspects of, uh, you know, interacting uh, and how do you, how have you managed uh, through that or how have you seen your peers manage through that? Oh, that's that's not a softball. <laughs> not making the balance of the time, <laughs> because th so you're right. There are those those peer group mentalities, those clickish things that happen, and I'll speak from the experience of. So first of all, being a black man, I think that there are, there are things that I know that people will do. And they assume that because I'm black, I'm not interested when I do things like I golf and people, oh, and they're shocked to hear that I golf. Uh, I purposely listen to different types of music so that when we're out and about and doing things that, you know, people ju just assume that, okay, well, we can do any type of musical event with Marvin or invite to concerts or whatever. Um, it is probably the hardest thing is probably dealing with the female side of it because I see multiple sides because I see women who really will overcompensate to be like the men and they'll be at the bars and they'll drink and they'll curse and, you know, say the, the saucy jokes and comments to feel like a part of the group there. Um, and that's a, that's just seems awkward and pushed and forced. And I'm not going to say I don't like it because some of them are probably watching. <laughs> um, but you see that you see where there's that overcompensation 
and then you see the other side of it as well where they're afraid to speak up and you know oh well the guys won't like it so i'm not gonna bring it up uh it's it is interesting to watch and it's it's harder to talk about um well i think it's it gets to the heart of things ultimately you know authenticity in my mind matters and being who you are and if you drink then you drink with everyone if you if you golf which uh i i don't frankly uh but i love to go fishing anybody want to go on a fishing trip i'm in uh i don't i don't necessarily need to be sent to the spa for every women's uh uh <laughs> although again a, a trip to the spa is not necessarily a bad thing either um but i think having authentic conversations about what we like who we are uh being being real as executives as people um and being able to have awkward conversations, um, you know, I think is important. I just think that just being able to show up and and be have someone say, "Come along with me to whatever um, whatever they may be doing." Whether you oh. if, if, again, I, I'll sit at the bar and drink a club soda uh, to be in the interactions, but I don't drink really. Um, and having friends who are like comfortable with that and bring me in that makes me feel good and makes me feel included um so as long as that continues to happen for me and my team and women that i work with um that's great um but again i do feel that there's often this awkwardness like are we are should we be inviting the women to go do these things with us um and i guess my my message i, I don't know how many men are actually listening right now but my message is invite us uh, you know, make us a part of things. Um, we're just people. Yeah. And that, and that goes back to the curiosity thing though. You know, if you're feeling like you're not sure if you should invite women, right. Or you're wondering, hmm, am I going to exclude this group or how, how maybe, uh, you know, instead of what you, you ask and maybe you're wrong or maybe think of a different activity. Right. Like if you're all, you already can acknowledge that this is going to create maybe some, um, some exclusion or you're, you're, you think it might, maybe there's a better activity to do. Uh, or maybe ask, you know, a group and, and, and try something new and see what happens. So there's definitely like this curiosity piece. And then I agree, like on the authenticity part, that's kind of where I feel like it's about belonging. You know, can, can you go to the bar and not drink and still feel like you belong there and be, you're being yourself, but you're also participating in the activity? Um, there's a stat, it was came out a few years ago that like 60% of people hide their real identities at work or some part of their identity at work. And that's really like what DEI or an inclusive environment means to me is like, I can show up as myself. I don't have to pay a tax. I don't have to pay the tax of hiding some part or pretending I'm, you know, pretending I'm something I'm not to fit into the group or go golfing or whatever it is. And that's okay. And, you know, and it's still a welcoming and a good experience. So um yeah i think i think we're seeing some of that change but i still i still think we have we have a ways to go there so let me ask the reverse of that question in a way that tries to explain some of what i was thinking so when i have talked with other women in the channel and they've talked about their women's groups that they go to i know that there are some that actually have dropped out of those groups because they feel that it is purely a man bashing session. And that's the place where, you know, it's just, you go and you complain about the men in the channel and why don't they let us do this? So if I'm hearing that, I know that other men are hearing that and that that could be a reason why maybe we don't ask women because we're gonna get talked about in those meetings. Um, I, I can tell by the look in your face, Michelle, you probably haven't been in one of those sessions. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, but that might be a sense of, because uh, look, again, some of the, my biggest champions have been men um, and, and some of the biggest detractors have been women, frankly, and uh, over the course, I mean, again, I think we get down to the heart of it. It's about humans and how we communicate with one another and how kind we are to one another and how we make people feel a sense of belonging. And, and I can tell you that in any of the women of the channel type of groups that I've been in or women in IT, I have not seen them be men bashing sessions. That uh, maybe that's a perception, but that's definitely not something that I have, I have seen. Yeah, and I think, um, 
me neither. <laughs> but but I do think um, the element of truth there or the element I can agree with is that each affinity group, now we're talking about women, but there's other sort of marginalized groups, um, they need a space to discuss their experiences together that's like safe. And hopefully it doesn't end at, you know, here's the thing, the sucky thing that happened to me. Hopefully it's with the goal of like, and how can I, like, how should I handle this? Help me process this. What can I do differently next time? Not that it's on the person that it happened to always to fix it, but a space where they can process that through and have different perspectives and feel supported, I think is important as part of, you know, the, the change we have to create. Not the only thing uh, for sure. Uh, but it is important to sort of like uh, have know that you're not alone in those experiences. So, Michelle, I want to go back to a point you made where you said, you know, you've found some women as the biggest detractors. So I know that as a black man, sometimes it's on me to represent all the blacks in the community. And then, of course, if there's two of us, you know, do we stay apart from each other? Do we try to compete for being, you know, the black man in the room or, or something like that? Um, when it comes to, I'm trying to ask this appropriately, <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a sense of competition. So I think there was, industry. there was for me when I was young. Okay, good. As a, as as a young woman in my in my twenties, I if there was another woman that we were maybe perceived as having similar skill skill set, uh, it could be uh, I, I like to say like a fight to the death. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as I matured, I started to see these women as oh my gosh, that person has a power that maybe I could leverage or she could leverage my. And now some of the people whom I would say were my rivals in my twenties became my best friends in my thirties and now are like lifelong friends in my 40s um, in terms of people who, again, become my board of directors. I think that comes with a level of maturity, frankly. And, and maybe, I, maybe I just didn't have that maturity in my 20s um, uh, that that cattiness could have been there. Um, but as I've certainly grown as a person and as a leader, um, I don't feel that sense of, I don't even feel that sense of competition um, I need to compete with myself. I don't compete with anyone externally anymore. And maybe that comes from having had great coaches and great peer groups that have helped me see that, again, I can only, the only real measure is how much better a person you are tomorrow than you were today, not, not against other people. And I think the more we can get people into that mentality, and I know I have three uh, I have six children, but I have three young women. I have an 18 year old, a 24 year old and a 26 year old. And I try to impart that knowledge on them now that you don't have to compete with anyone. You're, you're, you're smart enough. You're beautiful enough. You, you, you just have to be a, a better, kinder, uh, more, uh, thoughtful human every day. That that's what you should, th those are the things and to be happy. Uh, those are the things that I try to import, impart on my kids. Emily, you want to jump on that one? And... <laughs> well, I mean, I have a few thoughts. I think um, I agree with Mich I mean, I hope, maybe this is naive, but I, 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 I hope that the structure has changed as Michelle was mentioning, and I, maybe it's maturity of the individual. Maybe it's also been organizationally changing or systematically changing in that, you know, I think the root of a lot of discrimination is a power structure and a struggle and a competition that like, the more people you let at the table, the more people you give opportunity to, the less you have for yourself. So it's this kind of either or, all black and white, all or nothing, whatever, however you wanna um, you know, make the analogy. And um, I think that that changes, I think that changes individually as you mature in your career and you have more security about who you are and that you know, there is enough opportunity to go around. And I hope that some of the, the structure is changing for people to see that we can be more, um, you know, welcoming to all all types of people, all uh, you know, all kinds of skill level, all kind of um, you know skills and what people bring to the table, and that doesn't necessarily have to threaten um, your opportunity as an individual. So I think you know I, that's kind of for me one of the fundamental changes that has to happen for us to improve. I, I hope it's happening, um, and I, I I think it's it's um, I think women or, or that have that security 
um, and comfort with themselves are, are better able to support other women. Um, and that's not always the case, uh, but when it is, it's very beautiful. All right. So you mentioned that on that last point. So I tried to frame a question that I wasn't quite sure how to, because I don't think either of you have this scenario where some women think they, you know, have imposter syndrome, you know, like, you know, which is weird because they, I know that they feel like they deserve it, but maybe it's still because of the pressures and stuff like that. Um, how can we help make sure that women are not feeling that way? So I read, I read this question in advance and I was going to say, Marvin, you've cured me of imposter syndrome. All <laughs> I'm cured, huh? <laughs> um, uh, so unfortunately, I hate to tell you, uh, I still, you know, I think a healthy dose of, you know, uh, doubt, self-doubt and, um, and wondering, you know, what can go wrong or, or wonder, can I, can I do this is, is kind of a healthy thing for an individual to have. I really think, um, the problem start or happens or, or it trans, you know, trans, uh, uh, becomes a problem when the organization reinforces that and promotes a fear of failure or promotes like, you know, yes, you have to deliver a certain level and, or else, you know, and, and um, I think normalizing doubt and normalizing asking for help is part of solving the problem for, for everyone. And so an organization, I think that's an organization's responsibility actually to make it okay. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be 110% certain that you can do something to try and do it. We're going to support you in that. Like we're, we're a team. Maybe somebody else has a skill you're missing, or maybe you can learn it and we can support you in that. I really think that the solution to you know, solving imposter syndrome really lies in the organization rather than the individual. Now, you know, I know there's extreme cases and, and all of that, but I think uh, when people think about approaching a new task, I think it's normal to not know if you can do it. Yeah, and, and uh, I will echo what, what Emily said in terms of uh, curing my imposter syndrome. I think I wake up every day in, in the various roles I play, not just as CEO, as, as stepmom, as mom, as, as all the various, you know, I, I oftentimes question, am I doing everything for everyone that I can and should be doing? Um, and I think that that is healthy. It's, it's what drives me to go a little bit further uh, every day to prove that, not, if not to everyone else, to myself, uh, that I can do whatever I set my mind to. Um, and I do think organizations that help to, it's an organization's responsibility. It's my peers uh, and my board's responsibility to say, it's okay that you had an issue here. You're so great in all these other things. We're going to help, whether that's a coach, whether that's, um, you know, giving, giving um, additional support in wherever that weak spot might be. All of those things are, are how you can help a person get past the imposter syndrome. The other thing is, is again, creating a level of, I'll call it a personal board of directors who's there to, at your lowest points, to be able to say to you, are you kidding? You have this great, you do this well. And uh, think about this. Um, I, I've been so fortunate to have that personal, I'll call it that personal board of directors, which is both men and women who help me get past those areas when I have self-doubt. I agree. I, um, Michelle, you, you, you clarified something for me. I think, you know, the imposter syndrome or the doubt is healthy when it drives you to do better. The unhealthy line, you know, crossing the line to unhealthy is when it prevents you from trying. Right. And so the organization needs to kind of, you know, encourage you to try that and, and your personal board of directors, that's great. Um, and I've also maybe just like a really practical tip for, for anyone out there who's trying to, you know, aspire to leadership or, or grow their career. I've always found it really helpful to just ask like, well, what, what does success look like in this project role? What, you know, whatever you're taking on, ask yourself that, ask your boss that, ask the team, whoever's involved, and then assess like, okay, where do I feel uncomfortable? What skill don't I have? Or why do I feel like I might not be successful? And just put it out on the table. Like, I don't know, I've never led, uh, led a team before. I'm gonna need help from somebody who knows how to do that to get this done. And go, go seek that support. Um, I've always had great success saying like, I don't know about this piece of it. I need help to solve that part. 
and then you know people people will come to your aid nice very nice those weren't such hard questions you guys answered them <laughs> brilliantly they were asked um, brilliantly <laughs> got it. Uh, let's check the time here. Well, we're going to skip a couple of the other ones, and I want to give you guys a chance to answer and share specifically for your companies. And Michelle, I know you haven't been there long, but I'm going to phrase it in a way that hopefully you can you can answer. But what are some things that you have seen in your company, either before you started or after you started? Uh, what are the things that they have done to promote DEI in the organization? Well, again, I think a huge credit to the, the founder and co-founder, um, Joe Alipat and Vin Tran uh, at, at uh, Lion Guard, that they really set up a diverse workforce. Uh, and they've been very thoughtful about um, making sure that people do feel included. Um, we you know, even in terms of, you know, uh, Juneteenth is coming up. Uh, it's a, it's a company holiday for our, uh, for our, our teams. Um, but really thinking about how things are changing in the world and, and sort of coming forth and, uh, trying to be a part of that change and pushing that change through, um, as well as just, again, keeping an open, honest, authentic culture, um, uh, where we, are able to talk about these things where people are are celebrated. Um, I mean, you may notice the AI generated multicolor lion behind me. I mean, that was developed last month for for Pride Month. Um, you know, all of those things are again made to make pe people feel like we see them, they're included. Um, and I and I hope that just us as individuals being authentic um, continues that culture. At, at Lion Guard. Um, but again, I, I can't take any credit for that. That's That was built in and something that I liked and chose uh, when I came over to Lion Guard and continue, will continue uh, as we go on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and all those things take, um, you know, conscious energy, can, can take money, can take time, can take focus, you know, take someone to coordinate it. Um, and I think, you know, any, it, it's hard to name all the the, the little things are all, all the combination of things that make it a more welcoming place, make Synchro a more welcoming place or Lion Guard a more welcoming place. Uh, but, you know, people notice the time and energy put into those things. So um, Synchro is fully remote, which I think is a big way that we have flexibility for, for different, you know, folks with different types of needs. It allows a lot, a lot of flexibility um, in, in terms of how they work, where they work, um, that kind of thing. I think it really helps us attract uh, a diverse sort of uh, set of folks. Um, we have wellness days, which I think are really important. Um, I try, I know some some of the, some things you might look at like uh, you know you might think they're artificial or superficial or uh, you know just um, throwaways, but like they really show where the organization is putting their attention and time. So wellness days is a day we take off as a company every month, um, in addition to all the holidays or whatever else is going on. Uh, which gives people downtime to whether they want to get stuff done on a weekday or whether they want to take, you know, time with their family, whatever it is that they want to do with that time. It shows that um, it's not all about work all the time. We care about you as a person and we're going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to give you a whole day to do whatever you want every month. Um, I think that really matters. And I think making space to discuss really hard issues, even if it, you know, doesn't go perfectly to our, 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 our discussion earlier, might be awkward. It might, you know, make some people uncomfortable. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but we really do concertedly make space to talk about very difficult issues. Yesterday, we had an all-company meeting. We had a transgender uh, person come and talk about their experience transitioning for Pride Month. Um, last month, uh, we had a lot of gender partnership circles. Um, so we, like, we're, we're not, it's, we're, we don't shy away from having some really difficult conversations with the entire company because we want to push change forward and we want to be a space where people feel comfortable to express themselves, um, even if that is awkward. Well, you two have helped to not make this awkward. So thank you very much for, <laughs> for delicately and very nicely answering questions here. Uh, let's see the time here. Let me go ahead and 
acknowledge the people that are watching. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we had a comment, uh, inspiring session. Good. Thank that you was our me. goal. That's the whole reason we're here. Mission it, accomplished. It, I can take the rest uh, of the day off. Oh, here's a question. I don't, I don't know if this is a great question, but I'm going to throw it up there anyway. What would be one or two suggestions to remove bias in an organization and provide equity to women? Well, I, I can tell you some things that I have done in the past. I haven't necessarily implemented uh, yet at Lion Guard, but um, in a previous company I was in, one of the things is we remove people's names from their um, from their resumes. So we didn't know if they were male, female, or, or nationality that can create bias when someone reads a, reads a resume. And it was very interesting to see the outcomes of that. Um, and I do think that that is something that if you feel like you're, that there is bias in your organization, some organizations are better than others around that. It's a way to, to make sure that in hiring that you're looking, uh, that you're not overlooking, I should say, people who um, do it to an unconscious bias. Um, it, you know, the other the other thing is, is when you're, and I like to talk, to focus on, a lot on the hiring piece and also on the promoting piece is when you're going to hire or promote someone, um, have all candidates been looked at? Um, you know, if, if there are no women uh, candidates or there are no people of color or there's no, then can we look for another, can we continue to look? Can we can we make sure that we've uncovered every stone uh, to make sure that we have all the best options in front of us? Um, because oftentimes I think there's just a rush to get someone in a seat or to, uh, and if the rush delivers only, you know, white men <laughs> as the options, then you're, you're, you know, you might be missing out on some great, opportunity. You may still wind up going with the person who, but let's make sure that we have a pool of people to choose from. Yeah. And I think um, it's really hard to pick one or two, but if, uh, you know, but I, so I don't like these questions, but I would say <laughs> if I have to pick two, uh, one would be pay equity and transparency. So at Synchro, we also rolled out pay transparency this year, which was really scary. Like I said, we don't shy away from scary stuff. So everybody knows what their pay scale is, where they fall on that scale, what, um, you know, how it compares to the average for that role, what they have to do to get it to be higher. We look at pay equity across, you know, gender, race, everything, everyone in that role at the company and, and ensure it's fair. So that was really, was, you know, that I think a lot of companies have not tackled that because they're scared of it. Um, but it has gone very well. And I think it really helps uh, ensure equity to women and other groups. So that's one thing. And then the second thing I would say is ask. Ask the women what their experience is like. Um, take the time, like show the time, take the time and energy and show the interest. Showing the interest and starting that conversation will be a way that you can show that you're interested in it. And you'll get whatever the outcome is from that conversation. If you do it, you know, will provide more equity, guaranteed. All right. Well, thank you for answering that. That was not a scripted question that came from the chat. So good job. Uh, I want to make sure that I honor your time and make sure that we don't keep you too long. So I'd like to go ahead and start wrapping up. And I know that I had told you guys I would give you the opportunity to, you know, have any last words or thoughts or give an impact statement or things of that nature. Um, start with Michelle, do you have uh, anything you'd like to leave with us? Well, just like to say that as much as building my own personal board of directors was important to me, I want to just extend myself as a resource to anyone listening um, that is looking to have someone to, to just be an, an ear and to provide advice. Um, I think it's so important that we do that for our community. Uh, so anyone who needs uh, that level of support, please feel free to reach out. Uh, Michelle.acardi at lionguard.com. Nice. And um, Michelle, you've been, um, you know, before we end, Michelle and, and Marvin, but Michelle, just recently, since we've just met, you've been so kind and so um, 
generous with your comments uh, here and in the prep and on LinkedIn and everything. It's been really, really wonderful. I hope we can continue that relationship that we've just you know, started to build. And uh, I agree, if, if there's anyone here who could use some advice or has a question, um, I'm CEO at SyncroMSP.com. Uh, I, I respond to all emails. I have no admin, so <laughs> so guaranteed response from me, whether you like it or not. Um, and, and happy to help um, anyone, anyone looking for sort of career advice or, or leadership growth. And um, yeah, please reach out. And thank you, Marvin, for hosting this session. Yes, really thank you. And thank you, Emily. Well, first of all, I'm going to say uh, very bold to uh, just throw that information out there for anybody to contact you. Uh, I commend you for that. Um, being accessible and available is is awesome, uh, especially since I've met you guys. Uh, it's been pretty amazing that the time that you've availed to me, uh, you know, tiny little IT business owner and podcaster in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Marvin. And we're going to get you that demo of LionGuard soon. <laughs> You had to put that out in the public, didn't you? <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's going to do it uh, for this uh, panel discussion. Again, thank you very much. Uh, this has been the Women CEOs of the channel on diversity and inclusion, uh, an important topic that we hope to continue to champion. Uh, hopefully, we'll help inspire people to uh, look at some initiatives more effectively and inspire other women to pursue leadership roles, demonstrate diversity, empathy, and adaptability. Hope I said that right in a good word here. Uh, again, uh, they've actually given out their contact information. Uh, you can also contact me uh, here at the podcast, Marvin at itbusinesspodcast.com. We will continue these discussions. So always go to the website to find previous discussions and that's gonna do it. So we'll, let everybody get back to work and uh, hope you enjoyed this as I find my intro, outro music. <laughs> we'll say goodbye and uh, it's coming up on lunchtime. So hope everybody has a good lunch. See you later.